Hi, I'm Rod Adams. I blog at AtomicInsights.com. Today is May 11, 2012. There have been a number of scary stories floating around the internet the last few days. They focus on a doomsday scenario that I have started to call the Fukushima spent fuel fable. Robert Alvarez, who is nearly always described as a nuclear waste expert working as a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, has reportedly crunched the numbers and determined that if a really large earthquake effect, affected the spent fuel pool at Fukushima Daiichi Unit 4, the water in the pool might magically disappear. According to Alvarez, if that happened, the fuel would heat up, catch on fire, and start a conflagration that might somehow ignite all of the rest of the used fuel that is stored on site at Fukushima Daiichi. Alvarez has reportedly computed that such a scenario would release 85 times as much Cesium-137 as was released at Chernobyl. Kevin Camps, described as a nuclear waste expert at Beyond Nuclear, has called this envisioned scenario a global catastrophe. Arnie Gunderson, described as a former nuclear industry senior vice president and current chief engineer at Fairwinds Associates, says that the scenario could create Chernobyl on steroids. Paul Gunter of Beyond Nuclear thinks we're all on pins and needles with regard to Unit 4. He went on to claim that there are any number of things that could happen and that nobody knows. I want to try to calm a few fears. Some of us know. First of all, there is no physical possibility that the Unit 4 fuel pool will go dry. It has been inspected by qualified structural engineers and reinforced where needed. It has already withstood several aftershocks. No one who has any direct knowledge of the situation and a knowledge of structural engineering is concerned. Even if the fuel pool went dry, there is no way for the fuel to get hot enough to burn. It's been outside of a nuclear reactor for more than 18 months, since November of 2010. A friend who performs reactor physics calculations for a living has put the parameters into his modeling software. He tells me that each 15-foot-long fuel pin is generating about 17 watts of heat. That's about as much as a dim DC light bulb. Tightly packed bundles of such fuel pins could be stored in air with no force cooling at all and not exceed a few hundred degrees Celsius. Only one of the experts quoted in the Alternet.com story has any formal education in nuclear matters. Robert Alvarez was a music major before he dropped out. Kevin Camps testified to the State of Connecticut Siting Committee, Siting Council, that he attended Earlham and Kalamazoo College, but he didn't claim a degree from either one. Paul Gunter's resume indicates that he joined the Clamshell Alliance in 1976, apparently dropping out to become a full-time ardent critic of atomic power development. Arnie Gunderson does hold a pair of legitimate nuclear engineering degrees from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. However, his resume includes a major claim that rests on very shaky grounds. He describes himself as a licensed reactor operator, but a search of the NRC's database of licenses indicates that Gunderson never got an NRC license. Further digging indicates that he received an Atomic Energy Commission license. That's the agency the NRC replaced as the nuclear regulator in 1974. Arnie's AEC license gave him the ability to operate the 100 watt, that's about as much as a bright light bulb, critical assembly at the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. To put that power level into perspective, I recently featured the Reed College Research Reactor on Atomic Insights. That research reactor generates 250 kilowatts of thermal power. That's more than 2,500 times more power than the 100 watt facility that Arnie Gunderson is so proud to have been licensed to operate. When people claim that they're an expert and they use fancy sounding titles, to establish their credibility in the news media, 
they deserve some scrutiny, especially when they persistently create scary fables out of thin air that are based on faulty logic, faulty science, and faulty math. Perhaps if anti-nuclear activists had spent more time in school, they wouldn't make such egregious errors. Of course, if they had spent quality time in math and science courses, they probably would never have become anti-nuclear activists to begin with, unless they held a grudge against the nuclear industry for personal or financial reasons. I want to share a video that I clipped during the Fukushima 90-day committee report to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This was uh, available, this was done on June 16, 2011. Bill Borchardt, who was the NRC's chief of staff at the time, states that the Unit 4 spent fuel pool had caused some concern among the staff when they didn't know anything, but that later evidence indicated that the fuel had never been damaged. <coughs> the evidence was chemistry samples of the water and video of the pool itself. After I let Bill provide his calming evidence, I want to I'll close with a clip showing a UC Berkeley professor trying really hard with a blowtorch to ignite a zirconium alloy tube. That's the same material that Robert Alvarez, Kevin Camps, Paul Gunter, and Arnie Gunderson think will burn and cause a global catastrophe at Fukushima Daiichi. After you've listened to me and watched these other videos, please remember that Gunderson, Alvarez, Gunter, and Camps are professional anti-nuclear activists. They have a, a, an agenda. They do not want you to have access to clean, safe, reliable nuclear energy. Bye. I'm going to offer a little postscript. I apologize for my voice. I've been fighting really horrible allergies for about a month. Um, so that's why I'm coughing. I hope you understood what I was trying to say. Bye. With that, turn over to you, Bill. Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, before we get into the uh, discussion of the task force activities, Marty and I are going to give a brief update of uh, activities in Japan and then the other activities going on within the NRC related to the follow-up to the events at Fukushima. The conditions of Fukushima continue to, to improve. Um, over the last month, conditions of the reactor and the spent fuel pools I would describe as being uh, relatively static. And while full stability might be several months away, I think very good progress is uh, being made. There's been uh, notable progress over the last uh, month in implementing the roadmap that has uh, been put together by, the, uh, by TEPCO and the government of Japan. For example, the recirculation cooling that has been reestablished for Unit 2 spent fuel pool, and the Units 1 and 3 pools have been switched to a normal injection path. Additionally, a ventilation system was installed in Unit 1 that has improved the environmental conditions in the reactor building. By the end of the month, TEPCO should have a new water treatment system in place to process the significant amount of radioactive water that has accumulated on site. Additionally, efforts are underway to reinforce the Unit 4 reactor building and the spent fuel pool. However, this progress uh, is not without some new and emerging uh, challenges. Events like last week's temporary loss of power to the Unit 1 and Unit 2 control room and the recent heavy rains on site pose new hurdles that uh, need to continuously be overcome. We've repeatedly witnessed the ability uh, to adapt to these uh, challenges and to uh, overcome them. So. Uh, these are not major setbacks, but just uh, an additional complication and uh, issue that needs to be addressed. Over the last month, new indications and evidence have continued to enlighten our understanding of what really happened uh, following the events on March 11th. Early in the event, the staff was concerned that the Unit 4 spent fuel pool had become dry, resulting in the potential for a large radioactive release. The latest information that we have, including recent video and water samples from the Unit 4 spent fuel pool, 
indicates that the pool, it's unlikely that the pool ever went completely dry. The staff welcomes this as uh, very good news uh, as it's one indication that the event may not have been as serious as previously believed for Unit 4. Early last week. Nuclear engineers at UC Berkeley also showed us why it's impossible for the fuel rods in Japan to catch on fire. This is a piece of cladding, just like the ones found in the Japanese reactor cores, exposed to 2,000 degrees Celsius, hotter than it could ever get inside the core. If the cladding burnt, the nuclear fuel inside would send huge amounts of radioactive particles into the atmosphere. It's worse to have it on fire, much worse to have it on fire, uh, because then the fire, the smoke becomes a way to spread the material that's inside. The test proved the rods, while they would suffer some damage, would not catch on fire. 